Welcome everyone back to week two of the State of Change Learning Festival. Um, we are delighted to be back with a very strong team uh, from co-founders of Politics uh, for Tomorrow. Um, they're going to be hosting a session um, called um, Systemic Reconstruction, Exnovation as the Key to a Common Future. Um, so last week we already kind of initiated the topic uh, talking about organizational loss uh, as a part of uh, radical innovation. And I think what we're going to be exploring today with Caroline and Sabina uh, will be an, a really useful extension uh, and building on that, um, particularly focusing on the how we think about systemic deconstruction as well as reconstruction. So I'm really looking forward to, to the session um, that is aimed at being both practical and interactive and well, I'm sure we'll create a lot of mutual value. So over to you, Caroline and Sabina. Thanks for joining. Sabine, I'm mute. Hi, I'm Caroline. Welcome from my side. James, we can go to the next slide. And Sabine is there. There I am, unmuted. Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for this really interesting session on exnovation and how we construct together um, new um, paths forward into the future that have implications for systemic change. So I'm the chairwoman of politics for tomorrow and I also am uh, working at the competence center at the Lucerne University of Applied Science and Arts where I had the competence center for design and management and uh, Carolina will tell you a little bit more about politics for tomorrow and the exciting work we're doing here. Hi, my name is Caroline. Welcome also from my side. I'm the director of Politics for Tomorrow. And Politics for Tomorrow, as some of you might know, is a nonpartisan initiative working mainly in Germany and in the German speaking area, but is very well connected internationally concerning public sector innovation and also transformation. We're working with different governmental institutions from the local up to the highest federal level, but also trying to bridge basically relations between civil society and so-called niche actors and people in uh, the status quo in the mainstream within the regime. So now we told you a little bit about us. Um, we want to know who are you? On the next slide, you'll actually see um, that we'll ask you to change your Zoom name to your first name, last name, maybe a comma, and a city and your country code. Why? Because we want to interact, we want to use this session for networking, for maybe also meeting new people, and it's very handy if we can see right away um, who are we interacting with, where is this person from, where is the country, other things, of course, are so, supposed to be told within the interactions. And um, you can do that uh, by going onto your video and your um, participant name. And then you'll find a button that say change name. If you click on that button, you can access your name and write your first and your last name as well as place and country into your short description. James, I see that somebody is raising their hand. Maybe you can take that in a short chat with that person and okay. we will go on to the next slide. So I would uh, like to introduce you to the overall concept today. I do art is our motive and slogan. And uh, I would like to talk to you about the intention of our current session. We would very much like to introduce you to the concept of exnovation in public sector innovation. And we wanna do this by exploring the basic ideas from all your multiple perspectives. The um, intent here is also to make exnovation tangible through our collaborative group work that we will conduct in breakout sessions and that we hope you enjoy. 
desired outcome. I think we shouldn't just sit here trying to not expect anything. And I, and Caroline, we would like you to expect a desired outcome in, in uh, making this exnovation concept more tangible. So providing you with a vocabulary that's uh, workable for you. We would like you to walk away with an understanding of what meaningful excavation on different levels, uh, and we will talk about these levels in a moment, will uh, be and can be and how you can make use of them. And we want to enhance, of course, as always with any conference session and with any uh, activities, we want to enhance your personal exchange. We want to get you into knowing each other and into networking so that hopefully when you find people who are like-minded or are interested or even not like-minded, but interesting, you can do something after the session and collaborate um, in an ongoing fashion. The agenda itself, we were planning for about 40% input and moderation so that we can provide some content, but we want to focus with a, a majority of um, our session on interaction and working together. So we hope we can maintain that. Um, timing is always an issue, but uh, we will see. Then there are rules and roles for all of us uh, as in every conference, but in online, it's even more important. So we have a simple modi operandi and Caroline will introduce you to those in specific in a moment. But we all have also a shared responsibility in our breakout rooms concerning the focus of our exchange, the, the timing and the participation. So we encourage all of you to actively participate and to not hold back and to um, use that time because it would be a pity if you just spent time but you didn't get anything out of it. Time, um, as you know from the schedule, we have planned one hour and 30 minutes total. They will go fast, we know that. And uh, just so you know, we will be making all slides in the documentation available to everyone who would like to have them. For that, we would actually encourage you then to leave your con um, the contact and info in the fun retro so that um, we can send this to you if you are interested. And our effort is, of course, to be GDPR confirmed with any information we receive. Thank you, Sabine. I just posted the link to the Fun Retro, which was, will be our tool for today's session in the chat. Please click on the link and let us know in the green column by adding one green card if you've heard and worked with the notion of exnovation before or if you haven't, and afterwards add a Twitter handle or an email address, some kind of contact that you want to be reached out for or networked with. So I ask everybody to go into the Fun Retro link, and we will also see if everybody has access to that link. Go on Participants Network, click on the plus, add your personal card, say yes or no, to excavation, have you heard of it before? And add a quick contact. Only people who can't access the board, please write help into the chat and we will try to sort you out and find another way for documenting and participating. It looks like it's working pretty well. Um, that's great because like this, we can actually, we can interact, we can change ideas, uh, exchange ideas, but we can also produce something that um, wouldn't be here if we wouldn't have come together today. And we value that very much. And it's something that we'll actually create over the next hour together jointly. So I still see people adding cards. And still, those of you who have been participating in online workshops already know that like in a physical space, we have some kind of basic rules to actually engage everybody. Here in the short plenary input, it's clear that you keep your microphone muted. Thank you that you post questions in the chat. Also now when we have a short introduction of the concept, please post your questions 
while they're arising. While you are in the breakout groups, we will look at them and take some time to answer them towards the end so we can actually check how can we best use the time and also um, feedback to you and maybe clarify them some things that are complex and not easy to understand right away. The cooperation in the small groups, please make sure that everybody, everybody is joining with video so you can see each other. One person only speaks at the time, you know that. Try and listen to each other and build on each other in terms of yes and, yes, what I also realized and what I would like to add. So we're actually coming to somewhat of a common ground in the groups. Keep the statements short and to the point and be active and present. Of course, overall, we work under Chatham House rule. Everybody who is visible here, please cite the content that we're creating together, but don't cite any names. We still want to have a working environment that is basically full of trust and where we can speak openly. Steal like an artist. Also, we said you, you'll get all of the content. You don't have to make photos or anything in between. Just concentrate on the moment and add value to what you'll copy. And of course, you're still in a physical space. Everybody of us have pen and paper ready. It's very handy if you want to make some notes in between. In terms of being active and present, um, on the next slide, I actually arrive, uh, uh, I, I invite all of you to arrive here in this uh, space together and to connect um, head and body consciously. So please stand up with me. I'm already standing. You can't really see it, maybe. Um, stand up and maybe close your eyes for a moment. Nobody has to look at the camera. Feel the floor. Center your feet, where are you standing? How are you standing? Straighten up your back, your shoulders, feel how the spine is actually connected. Everything also from your neck towards your fingertips. Are your fingertips cold, warm? Can you feel everything there? Flex your muscles briefly, like flex everything, maybe also your face, and then relax. Open up your eyes. Look into the camera and give us a smile. We're super happy you're here. We hope you're here with your mind and your body. And we're gonna start a first short introduction to the concept of innovation. Sabina, please. Yes, so we talked about, um, we're talking about exnovation and we're talking about exnovation in the context of um, change, constant change. So what uh, Caroline and I uh, started to map, and I would argue that's a, uh, or, or would uh, like to um, ask you to think of this of a work in progress. This is a, is a bit of a visualization for how this constant change is interrelated and on what levels. So we have, of course, when we talk about change, and it's very obvious to all of us, really, there is an individual level of change where we feel like we have to change our values, our beliefs, our norms, our behavior. And then we also know that as we as individuals are part of organizations, business, private, public organizations, there is another level of change and there is a whole range of change happening within these organizations that depend on us people, but that are, uh, that are combining different factors on this organizational systems level. Now, we all know from our current situation, you know, the VUCA world and everything that's going on, that there's also a need for change across systems. So that is even beyond an, an, a single organization, a single public organization, or even many organizations. We have larger systems that interact together. And of course, all, um, there's also values, beliefs, norms, and behaviors. But what is changing there and what is, what is framing change, that's actually related to infrastructure, to law, to uh, ideology, and even to events. Some of them are natural, some of them are artificial. And there is this tension between the natural conditions, which is, of course, anything that is you know, biologically determined or physically like gravity laws. And there is our human action and our human construction as in how we cope 
with these different aspects of um, change and um, how we make sense of these beliefs, values, norms, behaviors, and how we then give those, uh, express those in ideology, in infrastructures, in laws, and how we contribute to these events. We can move on. What Sabine just mentioned in terms of you know, our human conditions and our natural environment, how we are actually put into the world, there are different concepts of change around us. And I'm absolutely sure that you as experts in public sector innovation or the field that you're coming from, you have learned about different concepts of change and different models of change. So we know there's a big variety, but what we want to um, present you today is let's say two basic concepts that we think um, are crucial to the understanding of change and the first one derives from ecosystem research so it comes from a kind of biology background looking at ecosystems how they're changing and it's called adaptive eco cycle um, uh, it's uh, framed by Gunderson and Holling in the late or middle 80s of the last century. And they basically understood that change is going on all the, all the time in ecosystems and that it's going through different phases. So what you can see here is a quick flip of an ecosystem, uh, of an eco-cycle. And uh, you can start, let's say, on the reorganization part it's the upper top corner where we base also our innovation projects. It's the phase of renewal. It's where we're actually starting to reorganize things that um, should go then into a phase of growth, which you see below. Growth um, is some kind of aspects where we want to stabilize, where we want to um, scale things. And then we go up into the phase of con conservation also for maturity to actually come to a point where things are um, big uh, potent very connected maybe also sometimes um, kind of rigid and this is also let's say the moment where let's say nature is going for release and for deconstruction and destruction to actually release this kind of very rigid connectedness into a new cycle of renewal you can see that this is basically also happening within systems borders or um, certain outlines. You can see on the right hand side that when, let's say, within or after the phase of renewal, this cycle is um, broken or this cycle is left, then the system change is happening and some kind of massive um, adaption has to take place, not within the current system, but going towards a new system. This is one approach stemming from eco-cycle research. On the next slide, you see an approach that also many of you might know, which is looking at socio-technological systems. So here you can actually see different levels, and I explain the levels for um, understanding first, on the bottom line, you have the micro level, which is so-called niches. There, innovative ideas, projects, technologies are arising to actually move up towards the meso level, so-called regime. It doesn't mean a political regime, but it means a kind of rigid mainstream that has dominant structures, cultures, and practices, and is basically also the so-called status quo. And this status quo is also, on the one hand, influencing, but also influenced by, by a so-called macro level, which we say landscape, where autonomous trends, paradigms, and slow changes are constantly putting pressure on this kind of mainstream, and sometimes also creates so-called windows of opportunities. If you look into the middle realm, you see three different constellations of dots that are connected. So there are many ways of describing that. It's just a visualization to actually say, in the beginning there is, or we look at a kind of dynamically stable constellation of actors, which can be politics, culture, 
science, economics, this dynamically stable constellation is brought apart or has to adjust because of maybe the pressure from the top and the uprising innovation from below. And it will reformat itself in a new configuration that is different to what um, we saw before. You can see on the micro level niches, the big arrow that is coming um, up is the arrow of innovation, where the connotation or also the research shows that small networks of actors support new ways of doing things. These kind of elements are gradually connected and um, form a kind of more dominant design. And within this dominant design, they are actually able to intervene in the mainstream and also break through with a new configuration. Based on this notion, on the next slide, you see for the first time our understanding of the concept of exnovation. Because, of course, although there are different models, the idea is how can we not only concentrate on the innovation, which is, of course, very desirable and looking into how new things are coming into the regime, but how can we also take part of the eco cycle or adaptive cycle into account to actually understand how do we have to consciously phase out um, uh, the kind of structures or attitudes that are hindering us for new configurations to thrive. So here you have the understanding why the notion of exnovation for us is crucial for mission-oriented transformation, because we don't only have to understand how things are getting into the mainstream, but also how we actually build hindering and um, let's say, uh, yeah, structures that are not longer justified within the regime or the, the mainstream. How can we actually phase those out and build them down? So this, I know, is very um, theoretical, maybe to a certain point. On the other hand, we want to give you an idea and a picture. And Sabine, do we have some examples to make that yes. more tangible? Yes, we do. If we would move to the next slide, thank you. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the postal service in the United States because here we can see that exnovation exists and exnovation always exists and most often it's in a passive situation. So for example, when you see that the United States Postal Service started with the Pony Express, and of course the skills of a mailman was uh, one of riding horses and hopefully as fast as he can. Um, the way that the luggage or the parcels and the packages could be uh, shipped was depending on what a horse could carry and um, the laws and the um, rules were determined by what uh, the service can provide in, in the framework of a mode of transportation by horses and by people. Now we moved to the railroad age and of course all of a sudden you exnovated skills like horse riding in no hurry. I mean it immediately happened. Um, this was not necessarily an active uh, thought, but it was kind of like something that happened. And when we move on to the mail being delivered by planes, or even today, um, not even, but especially today, when we're starting to think that maybe we don't need any more stamps. Stamps, as the Pony Express stamp was showing, have become um, the thing for the mail service. It's, a, it's its own currency, however, as we're moving to the internet age, we will probably start to have to think that maybe stamps need to be exnovated. Now, you can see there is a passive exnovation, which has happened automatically, so to speak, as a byway, because we're moving from horses to the railroad to airplanes. Um, but it would take and I'm not saying it will happen, but it would take an active exnovation approach to get rid of postal stamps. And that is one way to think about exnovation and innovation, that as we're innovating, we will find that there are some things that are no longer uh, applicable. And of course, also, um, we have to start thinking about how to clean out our laws and our rules and regulations, 
because, for example, in the postal service, and I have a little bit of an insight having worked on, on a project with them extensively, there was indeed, um, there were indeed some laws that you could trace down to 200 years of the postal service and that had a, a, a frame of mind that actually root, were rooted or was rooted in the idea that uh, the postal service was delivering mail on horses. And so if there's no attention paid to, for example, rules and regulations or infrastructure or skills or knowledge, or actually as in the uh, postal stamps, even like actual services and things and objects, um, that we need to include in our efforts to innovate, then innovation is always hampered. And sometimes these pieces and parts that we should exnovate um, prevent us from actually achieving the kind of transformation that we are striving for and that we're looking for. So really the last sentence maybe, um, the question is always which infrastructures, laws, services and values do we want to cross from the past, here the Pony Express, to the present, right now planes, and uh, in the future, increasingly the internet. Thank you. Thank you. On the next slide, I actually brought you my example of exnovation. I've worked in transdisciplinary processes concerning energy transition, and I have came across the concept of exnovation in about 2016. There has been done a lot of research in terms of a just or also ecological transition to actually understand how can we phase new technologies and also social norms in and how can we phase let's say non sustainable technologies out. So in Germany as you might know we have um, actually ongoing processes of fostering renewable energy, which you see on the top, like some kind of innovation approaches, not only on a technological level, but also on a social level, because of course, once we actually produce energy decentralized and we create a new energy system, it's actually reflecting in all aspects of society. And it has to do with other sectors in terms of agriculture, in terms of education, in terms of other um, economies that are related to it. On the other hand, we want to phase out coal. In terms of phasing out coal, there are big um, conflicting interests. There are people, people who are actually um, worried about losing their jobs. But on the other hand, we have to find ways of phasing out a technology that is not um, supporting, let's say, the common good of everybody. So here you have a very concrete example that goes through all levels that Sabina introduced on an individual, organizational, but also across systems level. I can um, recommend to dive into that. Um, Dirk Anne Hayen is uh, in Germany somebody who made the concept on excavation um, knowledgeable and is also doing research on that. At the moment we don't have enough research, but um, let's say it's coming and uh, we are busy with it also to understand how can we actually manifest um, uh, the technologies we need that are not destroying the planet. On the next slide, um, you see a kind of, yeah, a short uh, note on how Sabina and I are looking on the relation of innovation and exnovation and maybe also something to remember in terms of Yes, if exnovation is the necessary counterbalance to innovation, um, what is it actually characterized by and how can we also change this notion a little bit on the negative connotation which is associated with decrease, with loss, with um, development, so-called development losers um, and economic instability. How can we turn that notion into something that we actually need in terms of innovation not only being, let's say, the thriving force, um, but being associated with positive stuff, with increased development winners and economic opportunities. I think it's important to find a little bit of a balance between there and also understand that our way of transforming is not only based and cannot only based on acceleration. It also needs the deceleration of existing practices 
and even very temporary developments to understand what is actually going on and having a way of negotiating and deliberating the kind of build up of infrastructures that we are dependent on the future. So this is a very first introduction to this concept. Of course, now on the next slide, we want to know more about you. Yes, so um, this is a time now to get to work and to uh, get into the reconstruction that we are, are trying to achieve here today around excavation. We will start with a five minute reflection, self-reflection, where you um, begin um, to talk about or to think about your own um, ex uh, uh, excavation ideas. Um, we will then bring you together in a, two, in a group of two in a breakout session, so one-on-one, -on -one, where you can uh, share and exchange your thoughts and uh, further um, maybe dis uh, discuss what on an organizational level can be excavated. And then in the last session, which will also be the longest with 30 minutes, we will put you together in a group of four. So the two of the, the tandem groups will meet, uh, or, or it, two tandem, tandem groups will be together. So that then you can also um, explore and, and uh, approach the question on this systemic level. And when I say systemic level, really we mean across systems on this landscape level, um, so that we can start to get ideas how to move from the person to the organization to that uh, systemic, uh, inter-systemic inter level um, about how to go about um, ex innovation. And we Thank will you. use fun uh, retro for that. Caroline will tell you what that is. Exactly. I just posted the link again for people who joined a little bit later. On the next slide, we actually wrote down the question we want you to think about and um, please enter the fun retro link, go to the red column and let us know, maybe think about it for a moment um, on paper, but let us know what should be excavated in your working environment. Excavation as something that should be phased out consciously, actively, built down, not only let go, I'm quitting, but also something that has to do with structures. What is it in your working environment and why is it important? Take a moment to think about that. Um, we have five minutes. I don't know, James, is it possible maybe to have some music for this short reflection? And when you're done writing your card, add the card with the green add button to the column so we can actually see what is going on in your mind. All of that is anonymous. And um, it's more about like, where are we starting from and what can we deepen in the conversations afterwards? I'd say maybe four minutes from now and we are silent for a moment. And I also saw the questions in the chat. We will look at them, we will structure them and try to answer everything after the group work. Tell us what should be done. <laughs> Marcella, hi. Everybody's coming back. Sabine is there. Hi, Sabine. And Isabella and Virginie. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, Caroline, were you able to answer the questions in the yes, chat? Yes, I'm, I'm right. just going to run through it, Sabine, because we only have four minutes left and oh I need to the last uh, slide before we actually check out with the blue yes. notes, if that's fine with you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Welcome back, everybody. We hope you had a good time. I see a lot of pictures and a couple of people. How are you doing? Can you give, a, give us a sign like it's the lunch break and energy is going down. 
<laughs> or is it going up? Did you going have a good time? Yes, very good, Serena. I can see you. All right. Um, James, are we ready? Is everybody back? Yep. Great. So we hope you had an interesting talk in your group sessions. Thank you for staying in Gage, we could see actually how we're documenting together. I tried to cover the questions from the chat and actually, you know, try to answer what is possible in this short amount of time. Um, I concluded again because there were different questions about how does it relate to Schumpeter's creative destruction or to other, let's say, sustainability aspects. Yes, there is a correlation why people in, um, let's say, in academia have chosen the term exnovation, it works in many languages and it's intuitively understandable as a counterpart to innovation. As innovation has a normative approach to improve an existing status quo, as you know, innovation has to go into a context, exnovation has also to, has also the ambition to support a just transition. It derives from the context of sustainable development. Alternative terms are phase out, managed decline, discontinuation, system destabilization, all terms that are currently associated with, um, let's say loss, with also kind of heavy work and with other levels of conflict that we might know from the innovation field. Exnovation concerns mainly vested interests and routines accordingly to material or idealistic interests of established actors. That's maybe also a difference. And our focus, I think, in terms of policy innovation should be actually looking at how can we shift the focus from the termination of policies to policies for termination. There we can actually address lots of path dependencies on an economic, technological, infrastructure, user-related, organizational, or also legal level. I wrote down a couple of people that are interested for literature and where you also can find more, um, let's say, in-depth uh, research about that. And we're absolutely looking forward also to put something together as a knowledge base that will hopefully grow within the next couple of years. On the next slide, you, say, you see our understanding in terms of how would we like to integrate also exnovation in the public design context. We know it's about adaptivity. We want to foster adaptable public organizations. We have been talking a lot about resilience, but we know also from research on the other hand that vulnerability or fragility is necessary to create adaptivity in the center. Therefore, public design can not only thrive on innovation, it also has to include exnovation as a design purpose and something we have to take care of. On the next slide, Sabina will briefly outline the new role of design in government. Um, Sabina, what did we uh, learn today? Yeah, I think what's really important is that there's always a pretext, a context, and then a future of design. And we're often, when we talk about innovation, we're focusing so much on the future, uh, maybe on the context, but not so much on the pretext and what that actually means and how that pretext also influences uh, the future abilities. We had a couple of really nice terms that I want to mention now for, from the audience. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in terms of ex innovation, uh, so um, one person, uh, I think it was Harald, um, mentioned uh, that this is like a systemic um, 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 trash uh, removal, um, you know, like a, a, a urban trash removal for systems. I think that was uh, systemische Müllabfuhr, was quite nice. And then um, I had Stavrola just uh, mentioned uh, in a side chat that this could also be called like a palliative care. You know, like a hospice of policies. And so I think the concept we're beginning to grasp. And so really um, to remind you again, what this role of design is in government, it's really important that we know and understand what happened in the past and why. 
I mean, why are rules there that actually relate to ponies and skills of horse riding? And why is the performance uh, of, you know, riding the horse as fast as you can? Uh, why does it matter today? And, and um, things like that on, an, on a systemic, also uh, especially um, legal and policy level matter. And we should keep that in mind. Then the question is, when we take an analysis of that situation, how is that still helping us today? There might be something that is originally of essence to what we're trying to achieve even today. And if we can capture that essence and reframe it and reshape it in a way that we can carry it forward, that's great. But if it doesn't help us anymore, can we get rid of it? And can we somehow make sure that as uh, um, Carolina said, that we um, have a, a policy for determination? And how can we dismantle then these hindering unjustified structures within public systems that would allow us to open these new paths for the future? Again, I think we're talking about policies for determination and again, active ex innovation, not passive ex innovation, because we are familiar with the passive ex innovation. We haven't really talked about it. We don't, it's kind of like everybody knows about it, but we haven't really taken advantage of the opportunities. So the next question is then what is desirable in the future and how might we get there? That's of course disputed. That is a, a challenge because we're getting a plural, plurality of views, ideologies um, and ambitions together, but we cannot really simplify that conversation. It's hard and we have to engage and we have to hold, um, you know, um, um, and maintain that conversation in order to move forward as a society, as humans, as well as the planet. So then the question is how and where may I begin? That's our last question for you. James, on the slide we outlined again and you already saw it in the fun retro, there's one last little blue card to write down. If you and I were to exnovate, what would I do next? One minute checkout instead of the chat, use a blue card. Is there one thing where you think like, ah, that's something I should do within my working environment or I should go for within the realm of influence I have, what would it be? Write one last card for checkout. If I were to exnovate, I would begin with Perhaps a last reminder for anyone who joined late and has missed that the green first column is the column where you can leave us your contact info. So if you're interested in the slides and the presentation, we can have that forwarded to you. And if you don't mind, let us also know with a yes or a no, if you have um, known or heard about X innovation before today, because we're just curious. All right, so um, James, we, we have a last song for checking out. And also if you can move to, let's say the last slide. Yes, we, before you leave, you know, we check in and like arrive together by looking into the camera. Um, we want to go and give you a nice departure. Maybe you would like to close your eyes again and create an inner picture that you take with you personally. Sabine told us about many things that would be a nice inner picture. Um, if we could go back to the departure um, slide, you know, close your eyes. What is an inner picture that you're taking with you from this session that you might be able to remember in two weeks? What is that? I have one. Okay. Thank you so much from our side. We hoped you enjoyed being with us. Um, time flight. It would have been so much fun to get all of you personally. We 